um, where we started last night. So I know the past two weeks last week we pretty intense in terms of derivations, but the end is in sight. We'll we'll get to an end of that derivation tonight and get through some examples. So let's get a quick recap of where we're going from where we ended off basically. So last time we derived the equation for a pack bed reaction. is profiles along this reactor. We'll actually show how those are calculated. We've been mentioning it a few times, but tonight we're actually going to get through to some of that. Let's, let's see if we get to that example at the end. So the equation that we work with here is that FA0 is the integral from 0 to x dx over minus RA dash. And that's integrated over the weight of catalyst <coughs> W. So that's how we calculate how much catalyst we require. And we showed from our stoichiometric tables, we can find the rate in terms of conversions. So So those tables that we derived from the last ago, for example, we showed CA can be expressed as CA naught. <coughs> 1 minus x, 1 plus x, 1 x, and then we've got the, the pressure terms and the temperature terms. So the concentration definitely changes as we go through the reactor. Furthermore, if the reactor is operating under different pressures at different points in the reactor, that's also going to influence the concentration. So what we get here essentially is if I take this, this integral over here, I can, I can simply write, I don't need to integrate it, but I can, I can leave it as a differential equation. What I can do is, I can write it as dx by dw is some function, and I'll call this function 1, of conversion and pressure. So that function 1 is pretty messy. It's usually too difficult to integrate analytically, even for very simple systems. So the key is here, I take this differential equation dx dw, and instead of integrating it here analytically as I've shown, I just leave it in differential form, dx by dw, and express it in terms of all sorts of constants, but in particular in two variables, x and p. Those are the two variables that are going to change as I move from the entry point to the exit point of the reactor. My conversion is going to go up, my pressure is going to go down. And what we're going to do is we're going to make our reactor long enough so that we get the conversion that we require. So I don't know how much W I need, but I'm going to do it iteratively. I'm going to say, well, let me guess that I need five kilograms of catalyst. And I'm going to integrate over five kilograms of catalyst, and if I get the conversion I want, I'm, I stop. If I've got too low conversion, I, I extend the length of my reactor. So that's where, where we're heading tonight. So conversion varies along the reactor, pressure varies along the reactor, and that's exactly what the Ergen equation is that we started to work with. So in front of you, um, you're, you have the handout <coughs> that has the Ergen equation. What we're going to look at, at doing this evening is really deriving one important equation. We would like dp by the w is equal to function 2 of x to p. Okay, so in order to integrate this ODE system, I've got dx by dw varying. I also have pressure varying two ODEs in two variables. I can work with that and solve that. So this dp by dw is given by the Ogden equation. But in 
fact, not quite as convenient as that. The open question, if you look at the top of your handout from yesterday, it's actually not dp by dw, it's dp by dz, which is equal to some some mess. Pretty big equation, so let's not write it out. Let's just use the handout that's there in front of you. So I will write there that that's a subfunction of a whole bunch of constants, and it's a function of rho, and it's a function of the viscosity. And we ended up the class last night by looking at this change in density. So we had on the board at the end of the class, rho is equal to the entry rho multiplied by the pressure ratio, P over P naught, multiplied by the temperature ratio, T naught over T, multiplied by the flow ratio, F T naught over F. And we ended off by saying, well, this makes some, some sense to us because relative to my inlet density, if my pressure leaving is very high, it's a, this equation is telling me my outlet density is high. That makes intuitive sense to us from the ideal gas law. If the temperature is high at the exit of my reactor, my density is going to be lower. So both of those terms make, it set, make more sense. This ratio of total flows may not seem quite intuitive. It's basically due to what it's saying is that the flow leaving my reactor, if that flow FT is high, my density drops, and that comes about because there's a mass balance over the reactor. At steady state, I've got a certain flow in, Ft naught, I've got a certain flow out, Ft. If the density here coming in is rho naught, the density here is leaving is rho. High flows coming, um, sorry, high flow leaving, density must drop to compensate for that, to keep an even mass flow in versus mass out. So here mass in, equals mass out. That doesn't change. So the number of moles leaving goes up to accommodate and compensate for constant mass, the density drops. And then we ended off the, the class by, by just talking a little about, about this ratio of Ft over Ft naught. Let's just put up here from before we've derived that Ft over Ft naught is one plus epsilon x. So that tells me by how much my system expands and contracts. It's totally a function of epsilon, which is a function of the stoichiometric coefficients. So what I can do now is, the reason for going through this calculation is to get rho here in terms of pressure and flows. What I can now take is take this rho and substitute it into the Bergen equation because I know density is not constant from beginning to the end of the equation. So that Bergen equation that you've got in front of you, you look at it right at the top of the page, it's got a density term in it. That density varies throughout the reactor. So this is the equation that will, will show us how it's changing as we go, move, move from the end to the end of the reactor. So at the bottom of the page then on, on the handout, summing in that, that relationship for rho, we get the following expression. We keep by the z. There's no need to write this one down, it's there in the notes in front of you. Is equal to minus beta zero p naught over p, t over t naught, and then f t over f t. I just want to comment here on this beta constant. So firstly, beta zero is a constant. That's important to understand that it does not change in the reactor. From, from entry point to exit point, beta naught is fixed. So if you flip over the page, okay, so on, the, on this urban equation page, there's exactly what beta is. So beta depends on the porosity, phi depends on the mu viscosity, it depends on rho naught, it depends on the particle size, it depends on capital G, which is the mass velocity in and out of the reactor. All of those terms do not vary from beginning to end of the reactor. So I'm not going to write what beta naught is, it's really a messy definition, but the key is it's constant throughout the reactor. If we're isothermal. The other 
thing to note about beta, it has units. <coughs> beta naught has units of pressure over length. Again, that makes total sense because if I look at the units here on my right hand side, each one of these terms in the brackets, the units cancel out. So beta must have units of the same thing that's on the left hand side, which is pressure over length. Tp by z. Pressure over length. When you calculate beta, make sure you get units of pressure over length. Make sure you work in a consistent set of SI units so that you get that coming out of the next when you calculate beta. Because beta is such a messy calculation, you should be checking the units when, when doing that. So for example, you should get something along the line of pascals over the years. Now here's the problem. My first differential equation is dx by dw. So how is my conversion bearing as I go from the entry w to the exit w? My Bergen equation, however, is dp by dz. So I can't integrate dp by dz and the dp by dw. I'd like both of them in terms of w. So what I'm going to look at next is, let's rewrite that z over there in terms of w. Z is the coordinate at the start of my reactor, Z is zero. And at the exit of my reactor, Z is Z. It's the total length of my reactor. It's very clear that if you pack your catalyst evenly in that reactor, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between Z and W. W at the entrance is zero, W at the exit is W. And in between Z and W, increase uniformly. Let's take a look at that derivation quick. Fairly straightforward, but it is an important one to understand. Because at the end, this equation we're going to look at now <coughs> is going to tell you and your company how much catalyst to purchase. And catalyst is phenomenally expensive. For a very small reactor, you will easily be spending about 15 million to 20 million dollars on most react on just the catalyst, and it will last only a couple of years. So you want to make sure you can estimate W quite accurately. So W, weight of catalyst, is equal to, well, we're going to fill my, my reactor with catalyst. So if I draw a little picture of my reactor here, this reactor has length Z. And let's assume it's circular, it's a pipe. And this area here, I'm going to call A subscript C, is the cross-sectional area in meters squared. So most often these pack bed reactors are just ordinary lengths of tube that you can purchase at, on standard diameters, and they've got a cross-sectional area which we know. We're going to pack that bed with spherical <coughs> particles. And that catalyst has a known density and the porosity. So the porosity phi tells me how much the voidage is. 1 minus phi tells me how much solids there are. So 1 minus phi times AC times Z times the catalyst density. It's going to tell me how much weight the catalyst there is. Let's break that down. Um, so rho C over here is kilograms of catalyst per meter cubed of reactor. AC times Z, that's the volume of the reactor. The cross-sectional area multiplied by length gets you the volume of my reactor. Then this next, the combination of these terms over here, however, gets me the volume of solids up in the, in the reactor. So, that term over here, AC times Z is the volume of the reactor, multiplied by this fractional value is the volume of solids in my reactor. Or volume of catalyst. So the entire volume of my reactor 
is available to you. However, if only some fraction of that reactor is occupied by catalyst, and that's one minus five times the volume. So this whole term in red here is meters cubed, sorry, is uh, volume of solids, volume of catalyst. So the product of those gets me the weight of catalyst. Now just a note here that rho C is pretty inconvenient. We don't buy our catalyst from our supplier as kilograms of catalyst per meter cubed of reactor. But we buy our catalyst based on the catalyst density, which is kilograms of catalyst per meter cubed of catalyst. So let's call that a different density. That's rho B. The bulk density of the catalyst is kilograms of catalyst per meter cubed of catalyst. Okay, and that's equal to rho C times 1 minus 5. That's another interpretation of this equation above. I could multiply 1 minus 5 by rho C. So that's simply saying kilograms of catalyst per meter cubed. So this is an important equation that's going to tell you how much catalyst to purchase. You're going to either specify your pipe first, how long it is, and how cross-sectional area, and then figure out how much catalyst to fill it up with, and then place an order with the catalyst supplier to get that amount. So now that we know this relationship between W and Z over here, here's my linking equation between W and Z. Remember I said I wanted to re-express this differential equation. I want to eliminate dz over here rather than put dw. So that's now easy to do. I can, I can write it as dw is equal to 1 minus 5 times acz, uh, sorry, ac so many terms, I'm not going to write it up on the board and make a mistake, and it's in the page in front of you. So essentially, if I, if I make that substitution for dz, I can then get dp by the w. There's minus alpha over 2. <coughs> over T naught P over P over P naught. So this is a, a little unusual, this bracket, this time. P over minus P naught. NT over NT naught. So we're, if you've got that handout in front of you, um, this is the second equation that's on the top of the second page. So no need to write that out. But just recognize that we've gotten to that point by finding this relationship between dp and uh, dz and dw. And alpha is a constant as well. Alpha is a constant that's a function of beta, which is a constant. Okay, so lots of constants showing up over here. Take the derivative of the left hand side, take the derivative of the right hand side. All the other terms are constants, so they don't change. So just notice here we've got this term, this ratio of p over p naught. This ratio shows up a lot, and so we give that a new name. Yes. Uh, is it p naught over p over p naught? <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's in the handout in front of you. <laughs> Don't write it out on the board. So p over p naught shows up so frequently. We're going to give it a new name. We're going to call that y. It's the ratio of the pressure at the entrance, uh, at the exit to, to the entrance. So y is going to be a number <coughs> less than 1. And we also showed that ft of ft naught is equal to 1 plus epsilon x. So making both those substitutions, one for y, this other one for ft over ft naught, 
we get the equation that's now the second two thirds down the page dy by dw is equal to minus alpha over 2y 1 plus x y x t over t so again no need to write that just down just add add these additional notes to the page we've We've done, we've done now, the writing all this messy equations. So let's take a look at what we've accomplished. We have two differential equations in two variables. We have dx by dw is a function one of x and pressure. And we have dy by dw is some function two as a function of conversion and pressure at isothermal conditions. So you do this for alpha? Oh, good question. I'll just plug that down. Alpha has units of 1 over mass. We're done with reactor design, now it's back to 3 e over 4, integrating those equations numerically. So this is your Runge Kato formulas, and that's why we learn 3 e 4, and then you learn 3 e 4. So we're now out of the land of reactor design and you're back into the land of numerical methods. Two differential equations, one in terms of x, the conversion, one in terms of pressure, y, because recall y is p over p naught. So this second differential equation is telling me how pressure is varying along my reactor. The first differential equation is telling me how conversion is varying along my reactor. We can make some simplifying assumptions under, one con under two conditions. We can sometimes actually integrate this analytically. <coughs> so there are very few times where we can integrate it analytically, but if we make the following assumptions, which are pretty restricted, so if epsilon is zero, that means we basically limit ourselves only to reactions where there's no change in the number of moles. Or if we consider the case where epsilon zero is approximately, uh, epsilon x is approximately zero, i.e. conversion is low. that assumption and if I assume isothermal behavior, then you can write dy by dw is equal to minus alpha over 2y and you can write that as y is equal to the square root of 1 minus alpha w. So you can actually integrate that one quite easily because your dependence on conversion goes away. In this dy by dw, your dependence on conversion goes away. You're saying at low conversion or essentially if epsilon is zero, then your dependence on conversion disappears. I can find what my pressure profile is across my reactor. So P over P naught. Here's an important equation to add, add to that is if I express alpha in terms of beta, so I can rewrite that expression over there as y is the square root of 1 minus 2 times beta 0 z over p naught. This is an important equation to, because it's telling me what my pressure ratio P over P naught is as a function of the distance along the reactor. So at any distance Z from beginning to the end of the reactor, I can substitute in a Z value 
and I can find at that point Z how much my pressure has changed relative to the entry, so P over P naught. Again, this only holds for epsilon equals zero for x approximately small. But it's, so it's still a, a useful expression. And for, for those of you wondering, the last equation that's on the handout in front of you, there's a the reason for pointing this out is because if we, if we look back at our fluid dynamics nodes, and this question has come up several times in the class actually um, prior to this, people have been asking, well, what about the case where you've got a pack, where you've got a bed, a pipe I should say, with no packing? Isn't there a pressure drop? Well, yes, there is a pressure drop. If you recall from your fluid flow course, that pressure drop is given by the fanning friction factor and the equation you derived in your fluid flow nodes is one minus alpha p times the b. Okay. You should have. <laughs> okay, so even if you didn't, it's not, not, not a crisis. It's telling you that your pressure profile in your pipe, a pipe with no packing in it, is p over p naught is one minus the alpha p times the volume of that tube. Alpha P is given to you in the, in the handouts in front of you. Okay, so notice this, the very strong similarity between the situation for a packed bed is alpha times W, the catalyst weight, for a, for a pipe with no packing in it, same equation structure. Their uh, alpha is, or the packed bed is going to be a function of beta, which is a function of velocity, a function of the particle size. Alpha P is a function of the viscosity of the gas flowing from that pack in, in the entity machine. Now I just uh, wanted to up here and, and just cover a small example that really emphasizes the importance of this section and why we covered it. So, so here's, a, here's, a, here's an example that's not in the textbook. So let's um, let's take this one and consider this situation. So this is a very realistic situation where a company is considering a packed bed reactor and they want to consider how, how to configure this packed bed reactor. Let's take a look at a case where you've got a catalyst available to me. I have to use this catalyst. If I put it in a tube, it packs at 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed. I know that I need 1,000 kilograms of this catalyst. So I can then calculate W over rho C is telling me the volume I need, which is 0.5 meters cubed of reactor. So remember, rho C is the density of catalyst per meter cubed reactor. So I'm going to require a PBR of half a meter cubed. <coughs> now I can do that in many ways. I can buy a standard pipe, and I can just make the pipe as long as I need so that I get half a meter cubed. Let's say I have available to me pipe of five centimeters. So a pipe with internal diameter five centimeters. We can show there that the cross-sectional area is 0 0.002 meters squared. And the length of pipe I require to get half a meter cubed is 250 meters. That's an easy calculation to, to do quickly. We won't go through it. So what I can do is I can buy I can buy one PBR of 250 meters. But what if I take that inlet gas that I'm reacting, split it half and half, and buy two PBRs of 125 meters each? So 
this is standard, you'll, you'll often see companies do that. So you take your feed, you split it across multiple pipes, and you react it in parallel. Each pipe, I still have 0.5 meters cubed, I just have it split in half. Pipe has the same amount of catalyst on it. Okay, right. Is this valid? Am I still going to get the same amount out of the second configuration than I get out of the first configuration? Same amount of product. Yeah. The volume that you calculated, isn't that the cost of the, the volume of your catalyst? I need point two I need point five meters cubed of reactor, but I could split that up as half uh, a quarter meter cubed and a quarter meter cubed. I mean, isn't that the volume of just the catalyst itself, like not the main catalyst. No, no, I use, this is volume of reactor required. Yeah, so it's, rho C is the 2,000 meters cubed, uh, kilograms per meter cubed reactor. Is this something we can do? No? But over the next, you will have different uh, conversions, right? So over 25 meters, you have a different conversion than over 200 meters. But remember, each pipe is getting half the flow rate. So I'm not sending the full flow rate down the shorter pipe. I'm sending half the flow rate. So it's going slower down the pipe. It's got longer to react at the residence time of the result. Absolutely, this is allowable. Okay, so yes, you can do this. You can split your catalyst in, in, in multiple batches and react them in parallel. Because remember, the reaction rate is kilograms uh, sorry, moles of A per second per kilogram catalyst. The only requirement is that the reactant contacts the catalyst. So if it contacts it in one long tube, or it contacts it in, in two shorter tubes, I'll, it's still the same, it ends up evening out. Okay, so you can prove that to yourself. What I want to talk about is the pressure drop considerations. From the Ergen equation we've learned, what might be the advantage of going with the two PBR configuration and the single PBR configuration? <coughs> so the question was, what's the advantage, if anything, of going with the two shorter PBRs? 250 meters. So okay, 250 meters is long, but it's not long by refinery standards. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty reasonable amount. Certainly, it's, easy, it's easier to work with two short pipes. But let's take a look at the energy considerations, the pressure drop considerations. Do you need to get a smaller pressure drop? Do you get pressure isn't exactly linear with uh, how far you went on the pipe? Well, we should expect a smaller pressure drop because our, our pipes are shorter. Pressure drop is going to be a function of the length of, along the pipe. Okay, that's why this equation is up here. So let's take a look. This, this equation is telling me what pressure drop along the pipe is as a function of beta zero. Beta zero is constant. Beta zero is a function of the catalyst itself. But importantly here is Z. So shorter pipes, smaller Zs, lower pressure drops. This is why most pack bed reactors you will find in industry are exactly like this. They take the feed and they will come into a header and you'll split into multiple tubes. And those tubes are individually packed with catalyst. So here's your feed coming in and it splits to all these pipes. And you've got your outlet header that recombines those. And it goes to the next step in the system. So we very, very commonly see this configuration where we take our feed and we split it up into multiple pipes. And sometimes there's 20, 50, pipes inside a reactor. So they'll put all these pipes inside a bigger outer reactor. So you see one unit over there, but inside it is multiple tubes of, of individually packed beds. Is it easier to control this? That's a question. One long react, one long pipe is pretty difficult to control the heat transfer profile across the pipe, especially if you require isothermal behavior. So having shorter durations, I, I've got greater ease of doing that. Now there's an extreme. 
instead of having two PBRs of 125 meters, why don't I go to 100 PBRs of 2.5 meters? That would be very expensive. It would be very expensive to, to, to weld all these tubes and distribute the flows. The other thing is the shorter that tube becomes, you start to get bypassing and you get very uneven flow through that. So one of our key assumptions with the plug flow reactor is we get even distribution in the radial direction. Very, very short pipes. It's hard to get that radial profile correctly set up. The longer the pipe, the, the more easy we can meet that assumption. Okay, so there's very much a limit. One long pipe is expensive and a very, very high pressure drop. In fact, your pressure drop over one pipe may be so great that by the end, you've got almost no pressure leaving. Okay, you've totally consumed up all your pressure, your energy to push this material through has been totally used up, that you can't actually even achieve that pipe length. Your only option available to you is to shorten up the pipes. Here, this will show you exactly why. Here's my key condition. I know that I cannot take the square root of a negative number, so even if you just want to see it, see it from a mathematical perspective, I must have that one, sorry, that I must have that two beta naught z over p naught must be smaller than one. Or I can write that in some other way. Two beta naught z must be smaller than p naught. If my z is so big, so long, <coughs> that this term two times beta naught exceeds my initial pressure, it's telling me I won't even, I, I won't be able to push my material through that pipe. Okay? And beta naught is a function of particle size, it's a function of packing. And so you can very clearly see that very, very small particles are going to make this beta bigger. It's going to show you that you can't achieve that pressure through the pipe. Okay? So very, very important to understand this principle of, of why companies split their reactors into multiple smaller ones. I don't know why Fogler doesn't cover this topic, but I think it's phenomenally important to actually understand. When you go out and work in a company, you're going to see these pack bed reactors with multiple tubes, and the reason for it is exactly this reason. It comes from the COVID equation. So what, I, what I'd like to do here is there's a, um, just some numbers that you can take down. You can try this out for yourself. yourself the following. Let's say phi is equal to 0.4. Let's take rho naught is equal to 6 kilograms per meter cube. So this is a gas at pretty high pressure. It's got a density of 6 kilograms per meter cube. Viscosity is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 pascal seconds. Diameter of my catalyst particles are one centimeter, so 0 0.001. So 0 0.01, say. And G is my flow through my reactor. That's 21 kilograms per hour over AC. That gets me a value of three kilograms per meter squared per second. So that's my flux. Remember, we spoke about this last night kilograms per second per meters squared. So this is enough information for you to go and calculate beta naught. Okay. So rather than going through and substituting in, let's uh, just take a look at the spreadsheet that's already set up here for me. So I'll post the spreadsheet online. You can go try this out yourself. Okay, so here we go. I 
said, I'll, as I said, I'll post the spreadsheet, so just don't try to copy what's down here. We've got 250 meters, I've got one, I'm going to do it in one pipe, so that pipe is 250 meters. Pipe diameter was 5 centimeters, cross-sectional area comes out to be 0.002. Phi is 0.4, that's up there on the board. Density is 6 kilograms per meters, mu 2.5 to the minus 5. Diameter of my particle, let me change that, 0.01. particles are too small, you don't get your pressure drop that you need. So let's change this dp. The particle diameter is 0.02 meters. So I'm using pretty big particles, 2 centimeters in a 5 centimeter tube. Okay, so you've got to pay attention to that. Mass flow required, 21 kilograms per hour. You can calculate that your g is 3 kilograms per second. Substitute into that messy, messy equation for beta, you get a beta of 1, 2, 3, 3 pascals. Beta is 1, 2, 3, 3 pascals per meter. Units of pressure over length. If my initial pressure coming in is 10,000 kPa or 1 million pascals, this calculation is showing me I'm going to get a 62% loss. So for or 1 minus 0.62, in other words, 40% of my pressure is going to get lost. I'm going to have an exiting pressure of 600,000 pascals. So only I retain 62% of my pressure. Now what's, what's phenomenally interesting is how sensitive this is to the number of tubes I use. If I take that and I simply just divide it by 2, several things have to change. I now go too short of pipes, but very importantly also G, your mass flow per pipe, goes down. So previously I was flowing 3 kilograms per pipe, that halves. So you must, you must also remember to, you obviously reduce the length of your pipe, but you must also remember to decrease the mass flow per pipe. I lose almost no pressure this time. I get only 0.96 fractional loss, or 0.04 fractional loss. So very, very little of my pressure is lost by using two tubes instead of, uh, of one. Okay, so it's, we get a tremendous advantage of, of doing that strategy of splitting up my pipes. Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, do you have a pellet or pellet? Yeah, pellet, pellets are spherical pellets. So I'm assuming if you have to make it more like small, you can have to keep it in one, and so a good question of preventing the catalyst flowing through. If the catalyst particles are very, very small relative to the tube diameter, there's obviously a possibility that you're going to start suspending your catalyst and, and taking it out. So most, most often there's a, a, a mesh over here to keep the catalyst in. So if, is that only on the one side? So if I'm flowing up this way, I would just, yeah, just have a mesh over there yeah, to prevent the catalyst flowing out. Other companies will actually, they actually don't, they allow the catalyst to flow with the gas, and then they come out into a cyclone. So we'll learn about cyclones in 4M, if you take a 4M course. The cyclone will separate the solids from the gas, or you may be familiar with cyclones already. So cyclones then you separate your vapor phase gas and you recover your, your catalyst and you send your catalyst back around the cycle. Right. I shouldn't have called it fraction loss, I should have called it one minus that is the fraction loss. Yeah. So it's very, uh, yeah, yeah I, it's just the wrong, wrong okay. Now, this is, this is an important concept to understand, it's a great use of the Norman equation. Please go through this example, get these numbers down, or, or copy them out of the spreadsheet that I'll post later to the course website, and then uh, make sure that you can actually use that Irving equation and duplicate these uh, values of beta and calculate the pressure drops across the pack bed. But I must emphasize one thing, this is only for the case where epsilon is zero. For the case where epsilon is non-zero, you cannot get that equation over here with the square root it's actually a very, very messy equation. We cannot integrate it analytically. 
Because I've run out of time, the next example I wanted to show you will probably take about 10 minutes, and I know many of you want to get to your midterm, so I'm going to end a little early. Next class, what I'll do is show you the example of how we integrate these messy equations analytics uh, using a piece.